Uh, welcome to this series on probability distributions, where I'm going to be cracking open a whole bunch of distributions that are commonly used in statistics. The first cab off the ranks today is the binomial distribution. And we're going to start here with the cliched but quite useful coin toss example. Think about tossing a coin 10 times. How many heads do you think you're going to get from those 10 coin tosses? Do you think you're likely to get 10 heads? Well, it's certainly possible, but it's quite unlikely you have to get heads every time. Or do you think it's more likely to get somewhere around four, five, or six heads? Well, that is a binomial distribution, peeps. And each of those heights, each of those probabilities associated with, with these outcomes can be calculated using this scary looking formula. Now, if you've watched this channel at all, you'd know that I am not one for just applying formulas blindly. So we're gonna dig a little deeper into what each part of this formula represents and get you to appreciate that it's really quite intuitive. So let's start with something real. I know this coin toss malarkey. Studies show color blindness affects about 8% of men. And we have a random sample of 10 men taken. So the first question is what makes this a binomial distribution? So the prerequisites of a binomial distribution are that there are two potential outcomes per trial. Now that's a general word trial. Here each trial is a single man in the sample. But there are two potential outcomes for each man in the sample. Either they have color blindness or they don't. The second prerequisite is that the probability of success, which we're going to call P here, is the same across all trials. Now again, success is a general term you'll hear when talking about binomial distributions. Technically, success here means having color blindness, which doesn't sound like a success to celebrate, but uh, it's a statistical success nonetheless. So in this case, P is going to be 0.08 or 8%. The number of trials is fixed, so that's 10 men, and each trial is independent. So whether or not the first man has color blindness doesn't affect the second man's chance of having color blindness. So it seems that, at least in theory, this setup follows a binomial distribution. Now we're going to learn by doing in this example. So I've got four questions for you straight up. Knowing that this is a binomial distribution where the parameter P is 0 0.08 and the N is 10, I'm going to ask you to find the probability that all 10 men are colorblind, that no men are colorblind, that exactly two men are colorblind, and at least two men are colorblind. Now I'm sending you out in the dark here to start with because we haven't really discussed too much about how to calculate this, but I reckon you're going to be able to do the first few even without my help. What's the probability that all 10 men are colorblind? Well, here are our 10 men. For them all to be colorblind, the first one obviously has to be colorblind and that's got an 8% chance of happening, so 0.08. Of course, the second man also has to be colorblind the third, the fourth, and in fact, all of them have to be colorblind. So you're just going to multiply all those together to get a very, very small number. So I've written down here the probability of x equaling 10 is simply equal to 0 0.08 to the power of 10. And you certainly don't need any help from something called a binomial distribution to answer that question. And that's a very, very small number, 1.07 times 10 to the minus 11. Very unlikely. So that's your answer to A already. What's the probability that no men are colorblind? Well, this should be equally simple. We know that the first man, second man, third man, in fact, all the men have to not be colorblind. And the chance of that happening is 0.92 on each occasion. So that's 0.92 to the power of 10. And we get 0 0.4344. Now, how about this next question? What's the probability that two men are colorblind? Now, in this case, we know that two of the men have to be colorblind, so that's 0 0.08 and 0 0.08 there. And we know that the other eight men have to not be colorblind. So that's 0 0.92 times 0 0.92, etc., etc. So you might think, well, that's just simple. We're just going to raise 0 0.08 to the power of 2 and multiply that by 0 0.92 to the power of 8. And that should be our answer. But wait just a second. Appreciate that there's numerous ways that this outcome can occur. The first two men could have color blindness. Maybe the first and the third man has color blindness. Maybe the first and fourth man, or maybe the last two are color blind. So we know that there's quite a few potential combinations where two men out of 10 could be color blind. So that's where this 
combinations function comes in, this 10C2 function, which you can use your calculator for. You can also check it out on Google and it's just a, a mix of various factorial functions. But all that will do will provide for you the number of ways that you can choose two items out of 10. And you can see why we need to multiply that into this product. So the probability of X being two here is 0 0.148. So that's the probability of two men out of the 10 being colorblind. So what we've effectively done in the last few examples is used this formula here to calculate the heights or the probabilities of each of the discrete outcomes of number of colorblind men out of 10 in the sample. So reading this formula, it says the probability of X, which is our random variable, is equal to a certain value, is equal to that combination function, choosing X colorblind men out of 10, N is gonna be 10 in this case, and P is our probability of being colorblind, which is gonna be 0.08. So we raise 0.08 to the power of however many colorblind people there are in the sample. And then we raise the probability of not being colorblind to the number of people in the sample that are not colorblind. So when we found the probability of X being two, that's two colorblind people in the sample, we just subbed in two for our value of X. Recognize that from a few slides ago? And we found that was 0 0.148. And that's the height of this bar here for the discrete outcome two. And notice we actually did the same for when X was equal to zero as well. So that's zero colorblind people out of 10. You might recall we just did this final part of the equation, which was raised 0.92 to the power of 10. But realistically, these first two factors are going to both become one. So technically, this formula still holds to get 0 0.434 as the height of that outcome here, zero. And we also found the probability of X being 10. That's 10 colorblind people out of 10. And that was a very, very small number indeed. Again, two of these factors of this formula will become one. 10C10, the number of ways you can choose 10 items out of 10 is one. And also 0.92 raised to the power of zero is also one. So even though we didn't use this formula at the time, we just used our intuition for this value, this formula still holds. So what if you're asked to find the probability of at least two men being colorblind? Well, the best way to think about this is to shade the particular region of interest on your column chart above. So the probability of X being greater than or equal to two is just all of those blue shaded columns. And don't forget that keeps going on until five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. These are not zero here. They're just very, very small and not showing up on a graph to this scale. So what we could do is add up all of the probabilities from two to 10, but a simpler way of thinking about it would be to subtract those two probabilities at zero and one, because if we subtract those from the number one, we're gonna find that blue shaded region. How does that work? Well, we know that all of these probabilities must sum to one because it's a probability distribution. So the probability of X being greater than or equal to two is just one minus the probability of X being equal to one and X being equal to zero. So if you use that formula to find those two values, we can simply find that the probability of X being greater than or equal to two is 0 0.188. And that's the region of interest right there. Now you might be thinking, look, is it, there a simple way of doing this? And yes, there is. Using Excel, you can take advantage of the function, which is the binom.dist function. So if I'm trying to find the probability of X being zero, I can use equals binom.dist. And what that'll do is provide for me the height or the probability of each discrete outcome from the binomial distribution. So the probability of getting zero men out of 10 can be found by putting in that first argument being zero, which is our value that we're interested in. The next argument of this function that's required by Excel is the total number in our sample, which in this case is 10. The third argument requires the probability of success, which is 0 0.08. And the fourth argument requires us to tell Excel whether we want a cumulative distribution at this point or not. Now I'll explain what a cumulative distribution is in a second, but for the moment, let's just put false, meaning that we're just trying to find the individual probability of that one outcome. So we could use the exact same formula where X equals one to find the probability of having one man out of 10 with colorblindness. 
and Excel will calculate that for us to be 0.378 and that's this bar here. Here it is for x equals 2, it's at 0.148 and all I've done is just change this first argument of the binom.dist function to 2. Or we can do where x equals 10. And again, I've got 10 in there now and it'll provide for us that small probability of x being 10. Handy, isn't it? Now, if you're curious as to what happens when you write true instead of false in that final argument, well, that'll give for you the cumulative distribution function at that point. And when I say that, I mean the probability of getting that value or less. So if I'm trying to find the probability of x being less than or equal to 1, I can write equals binom.dist and I'll put a 1 in there. Again, make it 10 and 0.08 because they're the parameters of this binomial distribution. And by writing true, it's going to give me the probability of just these first two outcomes. That's x being 0 and 1. If I wrote false, it would just give me the probability of x being 1. So again, if I'm trying to find the probability of x being greater than or equal to 2, we've found this out before. We knew it was 0 0.188 and it's all of these values added up together. But you can use this cumulative distribution function again, but appreciate that the cumulative distribution function we're interested in to calculate this is the point from 1. Because when we calculate the cumulative distribution function from 1, it's going to give us these two yellow bars. Because don't forget, cumulative functions only go in one direction. It's always the probability of that value or lower. We technically want the value of 2 or higher. So we have to think to ourselves, well, that's just 1 minus the probability of 1 or lower. So that's what I've done here. 1 minus the probability of 1 or lower. So the final thing we can do with a binomial distribution is assess the expected number and standard deviation of the number of colorblind men in our sample. So here I've got two questions that ask exactly that. So the first one is asking us to find the expected number of colorblind men in the sample. And to do that, we can utilize the formula here, which is the expected value is n times p. But it's a pretty boring formula because you can kind of figure this out yourself. You know there are 10 men in the sample. Each one of these men has an 8% chance of being colorblind. So you're just going to times them together anyway and find that the expected value is 0.8. It's quite intuitive. So out of 10 men, you're expecting 0.8 of them to have colorblindness. That would be the mean of the distribution. What's the standard deviation of the number of colorblind men in the sample? Well, that utilizes this other feature of a binomial distribution, that the variance is equal to n times p times 1 minus p. And when you multiply all that together, you get 0 0.736. And then all we need to do is take the square root of that to get our standard deviation. All right, so there you go. This is the first in what will likely be a long series on distributions. And you can check them out once I've put them up. Here's some links so you can stay in contact to do just that. Adios!